Hey everybody, and welcome back to Ready Steady Play. And today I'm going to be reviewing Stroganov, which is designed by Andreas Stedding and published by Game Brewer using crowdfunding and delivered in 2021. So one of the reasons I'm reviewing Stroganov now is that it's back on GameFound and you can get it along with some new modular expansions and a big box edition as well. This is the deluxe edition from their original crowdfunding campaign and with some extra bits that you had to get later, which they released. It, it was a whole thing, don't worry about it. The main thing is that uh, I backed this with my own money and it's not a review copy. And if you like uh, the table I'm filming on today, that is a game topper, which you can find a link to in the description down below. So Andreas Stedding designed the Hansa Teutonica in 2009 and then has released a whole bunch of other games, which includes Ferenz, Norabek, The War of the Buttons, The Stauffer Dynasty, Gugong, and Stroganov. Now, I've only actually played Hansa Teutonica, Gugong, and Stroganov, so I can talk a bit about those other two during this review, but I can't talk about any of the others. Although I do have a copy of Stauffer Dynasty, I just haven't played it yet. And the artwork is by Matchik Yannick, who's done a bunch of stuff as well. Oak, which was a 2022 Game Brewer release. And the reprint of Preta Porter from Portal Games. So Stroganov is a competitive Euro game for one to four players. Its weight is rated at 3.27 on BGG, which feels about right. It is a Euro game that lasts for four rounds. And then it's over. I reckon the game is about 40 minutes per player. And it's a very mechanical Euro game. So familiarity with the hobby will probably lend itself to learning the game quite quickly. If you are new to the hobby, there's probably better options to get involved in. But actually, if you're looking to escalate from sort of middleweight Euros into something a little bit heavier, this is probably a very good sort of escalation point. I reckon thanks to the comprehensiveness of the information on the board, you could probably teach this in like 20 to 30 minutes. So what I'll do now is I've set the game up for four players, although I've only put out one set of player pieces, and I'll give you a rundown of the rules. This will actually probably be quite comprehensive, just simply because the game kind of lends itself to that. So if you want to skip straight to the review, you can find the link for that in the description down below. Otherwise, stick around as we go through the rules of Stroganov. In Stroganov, we are members of the Stroganov family. We've been hired by the Tsar of Russia to explore eastwards into Siberia and to develop our empire from this uncharted territory. We'll take our Cossacks and we'll go exploring through these new lands of Siberia, hunting for furs, as well as capturing territory along the way. We can also build outposts as we go to help us interact with the various uh, villages and encampments we come across, all the while trying to fulfill the wishes of the Tsar and keep him happy. At the end of the game, the most influential Stroganov with the most power will win. So I've already set this game up for four players, but there's only one set of player pieces here. Up here on the board, you can see various pieces of useful information including this game track here. This token will move along and when it gets to the final space, the game will be over. Below is a shorthand for end game scoring. Below that is the marketplace where we'll be trading things. Over here are shorthand reminders of all of the basic actions in the game. Or if you see the silver icon, that's a basic action. Moving to the right, we have here an entire turn which shows three phases of player actions which are all shorthanded here that we'll look at in a minute. And finally, the winter phase, shorthanded here. And then on this side of the board, you've got various little supplies for all of the tokens you might need, as well as draw stacks for the tokens that are refreshed. You've got what's called the story track here, and the story tokens below it, which work with the story track. Below that, we've got this Siberia track, which our Cossacks will move right along. And these are set up in different regions of Siberia as well, each of which contains a village, a yurt, and a Sars wish card as well. You'll also see along the top here spaces to build outposts and 
a fur, which is the fur for this region. Now in the beginner setup, these escalate numerically with one fur having been randomly assigned to this trade action. For more experienced players, you can fully randomize the setup of these furs so they don't escalate numerically, but are instead entirely random. We've also got a player area down here. Now blue is the first player, which we know because they are rightmost in the lineup of Cossacks. But we've also got three horses here, which is the starting resources for the first player. You also get to start with an outpost, a coin, a fur, which you will have drafted, along with this starting wish card as well. We've also got some more outposts here, but we don't have them yet. They're separate and we need to acquire them. You can see here as well, we've got a trophy track. And if I flip the board over, you can see a different one. This is the symmetrical trophy track that everyone has. And this is the asymmetrical side of the board, which I've used in this setup. So up here we can see the season track here and we start in the spring of the first year. And then we move along and when we get back to spring, that's the beginning of year two. You can see there are four springs and four winters, four years. At the end of the fourth winter, the game is over. Final scoring will take place and that will be the end of the game. There is a B above the second winter because at the end of year two, if there are any cards and tiles from the A set still on the board, remove them from the game and replace everything with cards and tiles from the B set. Down here you can see the final scoring. Wherever you see this shield icon, that's going to be points, which we'll track on this victory point track up here. Whenever you see this gold symbol in the game with the number on it, that's going to be points that you score right away. So this is immediate points and this is end game scoring. And these are all the things you're going to get end game scoring points for. But we'll learn all about in-game scoring towards the end of this explanation. Each of the three action phases in a year, spring, summer, and autumn, are all resolved in the exact same way. You can see that over here on this very handy player aid here. So this is spring, summer, and autumn. This is telling you exactly what happens. So during the action phase, each player will be forced to move along the Siberia track. And this means that their Cossack will move one or two spaces at least, and that you can pay horses to move additional spaces. One horse will allow you to move three, three horses will allow you to move four, and six horses will allow you to move five spaces. After that, you will get to take one basic action, and this is a shorthand for the cost of hunting, which is a basic action. And then after that, you may take a second basic action, or you may take an advanced action for free. After that, you may take another action, which could be a basic action or an advanced action with a cost. Over the course of the game, you're going to need horses for lots of things. Moving, hunting for furs, buying furs, and building outposts, all of which are really important. So horses are basically just a currency in the game. But there's a lot of demand for them in different at uh, different times. So the action phase starts with a mandatory movement of one forward. You may elect to move an additional step as well. You can uh, then pay horses to move further along the Siberia track. After that, you'll do a number of actions, and then that will be the end of your turn. And it's recommended that you set your Cossack on their side once your turn is over to note where you are on the Siberia track and also that you've completed your turn. Subsequent players will continue from rightmost to leftmost. That's how the turn order in this game is managed. This means that over the course of play, the turn order might change. For example, if another Cossack overtakes one, they were previously behind. This also sets up the turn order for the next season or phase. Now your positioning in the different regions here on the game board is really important and you'll see why that's going to be something that you're going to have to really think about over the course of your turn as we continue through this explanation. So once you've resolved the movement of your Cossack then you get to take a basic action. There are five basic actions in the game. The five basic actions are take a coin, move your Cossack one or two steps forward, 
or one or two steps backward. Take four horses. You may hunt once or hunt twice if you pay a coin. And finally, you may trade. So in this game, you can trade rabbit furs for either a coin, two movements on the story track. You may move your Cossack up to two forward or up to two back. We may take three horses. The hunt action is how we're going to gather the furs from the landscape tile that we've landed on. So in Stroganov, Siberia is divided into regions which contain two or more landscape tiles. When you end up on a landscape tile, you may hunt the furs that are currently on that tile. Now it's worth noting that these will never be replenished. So you'll have to move further and further rightward, eastward, in order to acquire additional furs as the furs disappear. When you hunt, you can take the top fur for free, or you can spend horses to take the higher numbered furs, which are typically more valuable. Now it should be noted that if I took a hunt action and then paid three horses to take this deer, and then I paid a coin to take a second hunt action, and I wanted this rabbit, I'd still have to pay another horse. Obviously, there'd be no point in paying two horses to take this rabbit because they're the same. So once you've resolved your first basic action, you may then take a second basic action or an advanced action. There are five advanced actions in the game that are all shown on the main game area. Now, it should be noted with the advanced actions, which are indicated by the little gold ring on the spaces here, that you can only take the advanced actions in the region where your Cossack is located or in regions where you've built an outpost. The first advanced action is the village action, which is this tile here. These are all different and they have been randomly placed during setup. This one allows you to take a fur tile from the market. This one allows you to advance on the trophy track. More on these later on. What's notable about the village tile is that once the action is taken, the tile remains in place and will be there for the entire game. Unlike the yurts, which are another form of advanced action, and when you take the yurt action, you get everything shown on the tile, and then it's removed from the game. These will be replaced in the winter phase. The third advanced action is to collect one of these SAR wishes cards. These are contracts that you can fulfill, and they will either give you bonus points right away, or a passive benefit, or an immediate reward. The SAR's wishes cards will be replaced in the winter phase. The fourth advanced action is to build an outpost. First, a player must have one available outpost in their player area. These have to be acquired from their personal supplies through the action, which looks like this. You can place an outpost in the first spot for free, but if somebody's already taken that, you must pay a horse to get into the second spot and two horses to get to the third spot. And in a four player game, there are not enough spots in every region for every player. The final advanced action is to purchase the landscape tiles. This is shown here by the gold ring. When you purchase a landscape tile, you must pay two furs plus an additional fur for every remaining fur tile on the landscape as well as any tiger tiles that happen to be on the landscape. These furs that you pay must all match the fur cost for the region. So to buy the tile that Blue's on at the moment would cost four otter furs. When Blue buys this tile, they'll immediately receive two points and five horses, and then they can take it and put it in their player area. Any furs on it are returned to the bag, and a gap is left with the Cossack standing on it. These will be replaced in the winter phase. The tile is flipped over and placed in Blue's player area here, and just simply has on the back a shorthand reminding you of how these are scored in the end game. After you've performed your second action of the round, you may then perform an additional action, either a basic action which will cost you one fur of any type or an advanced action, which will cost you one fur matching the region that the action is being taken in. So if Blue wants to take an advanced action in this region, 
they could do so because they have an outpost. In order to do that as their third action of the round, they'll have to play a fur matching the region's fertile. There's also three auxiliary actions you can do, which you can do as many times on your turn as you're able and want to. The first auxiliary action is that you may pay five horses to take a tile from the marketplace or the bag. That means just selecting one of the tiles here and adding it to your supply it is immediately replaced. Or, whenever you see this bag fur tile icon, that means you draw two from the bag and add one to your hand, returning the other to the bag. We have our bag of fur tiles here, which we use for setup and everything else in the game. You may also spend one horse to trade with the market. The first trade, the top trade, is discard one fertile and take one from the market which is numerically lower than the tile you discarded. So if you discarded the five fur, you could have a fox or a rabbit from the market. It would then be immediately replenished. You can also discard two furs of any quality to take one fertile of any type from the market. The final auxiliary action is to complete one of the SARS wish cards. Every player starts with one SARS wish card, and you can acquire additional wish cards through the advanced action we just saw. In order to complete one of the SARS wish cards, you must have all of the furs shown here on the left side of the card. If you have three of these bobcat furs, then you can complete this wish card. You must return any furs outlined in red to the supply. The others you can keep, unless you're using a tiger, more on that later. You'll immediately gain one point, and then you will gain whatever's shown here, which could be an immediate reward, or it could be a passive benefit. This is explaining that whenever you take a third action on your turn, and it is an advanced action, instead of spending a fur that matches the region where the action you're taking is located, you can instead spend any fur. And when we complete this, we'll slide it here into our player board to show we've got these passive benefits moving forward. We see an example of a SARS wish card that just straight up gets you two points and one tiger token. Once you've taken the tiger token into your play area and scored the victory points, you can flip it face down, you won't need to use it again. In addition to what we've already discussed, you can also always spend a fur and a coin as though they were any other kind of fur, and you can spend a tiger as a wild fur. But whenever you do this, you must discard the tiger token from your player area back to the supply. This is meaningful because they're worth two points at the end of the game if you hang on to them. Now, whenever you see the loot symbol in the game, this is storytelling points. When we gain storytelling points, we're gonna move up the storytelling track here. If you ever get an, an amount of storytelling points that would move you into the end position or beyond, instead you stop at the top and then you pick one of the storytelling tiles under the track in order to enact. When you pick a tile, you'll spend the amount of points shown on the tile and gain the benefit. In this case, I will spend four points and I will gain a trophy, which we'll talk about in just a minute. I could have had another fur using the bag action for two points. There's a handy reminder up here. Whenever you get a fur bag action, you draw two from the bag, keep one and return the other. Over here, I could have spent four to take an outpost from my personal supply into my player area, and now it's available for use. There's a little points reminder as well to remind you that at the end of the game, any leftover storytelling points are exchanged at a rate of four for one. Whenever you gain a trophy point, this allows you to interact with your trophy track here on your player board. You may advance your trophy icon if you want, but you must pay any furs shown in the space that you're moving into. 
This means they must be in your supply and you must return them to the bag. Regardless of whether you choose to do this or not, after you can take a reward shown here on the right. So if I was here, I could have a village action provided it's not the trophy action. I could have two storytelling points or three horses. When you make it all the way to the end, you can have two rewards from above this position provided they're not the same. So I could, for example, take a yurt and then also take a fur from the marketplace and have two storytelling points. If I get further trophy actions, I can't advance on the track anymore, but I will still be able to get these trophy benefits. There's also end game scoring based on how far you progress over the course of the game. After each player has had three turns, the season marker will move into the winter phase and will resolve it. The winter phase begins with everybody gaining two horses and then an additional horse for every banner that they've acquired. Banners are typically gained through taking the village advanced action. By taking that action, players can add a banner to their player area, which they'll keep for the rest of the game. Its only purpose is additional horses right now. Once that's resolved, if any player has any winter effects on their completed SAR wish cards, they can resolve those now. For example, if you've completed this card, you can have two storytelling points right now. If these ever move you into the 12th position or beyond, you stop in the 12th position and you gain the effect of one of the storytelling tiles, just like we saw earlier. Then the player who's rightmost in Siberia gains two additional storytelling points. Again, if they make it to the end, they resolve that as discussed. And then the player in second gains a storytelling point. And if they make it to the end, they resolve it as discussed. Finally, each player, starting with the rightmost on the storytelling track, will go through and will buy one of the leftover tiles for this year. So in this example, blue could buy any of the tiles and they would go first. If they took this tile, for example, they would gain a coin and move back two. Then it would be red's turn, and if they took this tile, they would gain an outpost and go back four. Then it would be yellow's turn, and they could only afford this one. If they decide to take it, they'd gain a fur and go back two. And finally, it's green's turn, but they cannot afford the final tile. Then everyone's Cossack is moved back to the start of the Siberia track, any empty spaces in the Siberia track that are left because someone bought a landscape tile are filled by moving all the remaining tiles as far to the left as possible to close the gaps and then filling in the new open spaces from the right from the draw stack of landscape tiles. Any new tiles going out will come with a full complement of furs, but the furs missing from existing tiles are not replaced. After that, the six tiles in the marketplace are returned to the bag, and then it's refreshed with six new tiles, and then remove all remaining storytelling tiles and replace them from the deck. And then the yurts slide to the left into any available positions and are replaced towards the right. And the same is done with the SAR wish cards. So the yurts will slide to the left and then start to be replaced from the leftmost position. And it's the same with the SARS wish cards. They'll all slide into the left positions and then the leftmost open slot will be refilled from the deck. In the final year, you'll skip this last row of the winter phase, so just row three, and you'll go straight to final scoring instead. This first icon is telling you that any completed czar wish cards with final scoring on them will be scored now. For example, this one here will give you one point for every czar wish you've completed. This one's going to reward you endgame scoring points for completed sets of landscape. If we remember the back of our landscape tiles here, they show you that a set of three landscape tiles is three points and a set of four is six points. And what you're looking at here are the types. So this one's a woodland type. And so we'd want to pair that with a swamp, a mountains, and a plains. 
This next one is reminding you that every unused tiger tile is worth two points. And this next one is reminding you to score your player trophy track based on how far you've made it. This one is telling you, based on the number of regions where you've put outposts, you will gain points. There's a little table over here telling you how many points you'll get. So if you put an outpost in one region, one point. But if you've managed to put an outpost in all five regions, 15 points. For every outpost you've got in your personal pool, which you've taken from the supply, you're going to get one point. For every two coins you've got, you're going to get a point. For every two furs you've got, you're going to get a point. Now it's important to note that you should trade all of your horses for furs before this happens. It doesn't really matter which furs you take because it's still two for one. So you can trade five horses for a fur. So trade five horses for a fur as many times as you can, and then count up all your furs and take them at a rate of two to one. And finally, as we saw earlier on the storytelling track, it's four remaining storytelling points for one victory point. Once everyone's calculated them on the victory point track, then whoever has the most points is the winner. And if there's a tie, then whoever's figure ended up rightmost in Siberia from amongst the tied players is the winner. And I mean, so that's pretty much everything you need to know in order to play Stroganov. So now that you know how to play, let's talk a bit about the game and how I feel about it. Because I love Hansa Teutonica. That came out in 2009. I've got an original 2009 copy right here with all of the expansions in it as well. So this is effectively the same as the big box reprint that came out a little while ago. But, uh, you know, it's the original one. And the box is smaller. Um, I've got Gugong as well, the big box deluxe version of Gugong here. But I mean, I love Hansa Teutonica. It's this really vicious root building game with tons of player interaction, and it's not really comparable to Stroganov at all. Gugong is a much more comparable game that involves this gift giving system where you play cards from your hand to take actions but all the cards have a numerical rating that has to trump uh, cards that have already been played to take that action in the same turn. So there's these really interesting timing considerations. In addition, in addition to having like a numerical value, the cards also have bonuses on. So you kind of want to play them into the matching action so you can get the bonuses. It's very interesting. It does have some flaws in the core game, I haven't played with any of the expansions yet. Obviously, I have the big box with all the expansions in. I'm really keen to take a look at it. I'd like to play some more Gugong. Stroganov feels a bit like a step sideways for me. But before I get into that, uh, a few things I really like about it. I really love the graphic design and the art in this game. I love them both. I don't know how much of the graphic design was done by Magic Yannick. I know he did the art. But I don't know how much of the graphic design he did, but it's superb. It takes what would otherwise be a very fiddly game with a lot of small rules that were hard to remember and just makes it so accessible and so nice. In terms of quality of life for the players, this is like top tier, 11 out of 10, absolute peak. All of this iconography along the top of the board, all of the turn layout here, the little arrows that show you how far you move, the prices of everything indicated, the shorthand for hunting, all of all of the information that's up here on the top of the board is absolutely top tier layout and it's incredible. I also really like the art in the game. I really like the landscape tiles. They're really artistic. They're really nicely done. They all look beautiful. And they didn't need to. They didn't need to be this extravagant but they are and they also quite match up with their type which is nice so there's a little bit of helpfulness to the art but the art's otherwise really appealing and i really like that i also really like the region art each region contains a village and a yurt these are randomized these are fixed for the whole game but these change over the course of the game either way i really like how there's spaces for them and there's spaces in each region that sort of match this and the art matches up with it covers it up and then it lives there and it all kind of lines up with the artwork on the board and that's just really really nice 
Um, there's just something really appealing about it, and I really, really like it. And so now I'm going to talk about the mechanisms of this game, and I'm kind of struggling to identify what the core mechanism is. Like, for Hansa Teutonica, I'm like, this is a root-building game with intense player interaction, vicious player interaction. Gugong, it's all about the gift cards and prioritizing the order you do actions in to make really interesting timing considerations. I guess in Stroganov, it's this Siberia track and how you're always moving right and how these tiles get scarcer and scarcer as the game goes on. None of them are going to replenish unless players purchase the actual tiles themselves. And I suppose it's the Siberia track that really creates tension in your turn-to-turn decision-making. Because you must move at least one step forward. Although you can then move a step or two backwards as well. Uh, as the game progresses, these early tiles are going to become scarcer, so moving eastward is going to become more critical being on the rightmost gives you some advantages it lets you go first it gets you some storytelling points in the winter phase but really the only sort of the main advantage of being rightmost is more about the other players for example these yurt tiles are really good and once someone grabs them they're gone and you'll notice that you know there's two spaces in this region for example as you move rightward, there gets to be more spaces in each region as well. And interestingly, in this particular board setup, all of the outpost actions wound up in this rightmost region. Obviously, this is fixed for the whole game, so that's going to be quite game-defining. This one will move left if no one gets it, but I suspect someone will, especially because, well, actually, they might be more tempted to take the village action if they get all the way here, but... <laughs> In either case, it's not going to be available until later rounds. So that's interesting. Um, there's a, a real temptation to get into the rightmost uh, region and put your outpost out as early as possible. So, you know, that's, uh, that's an advantage of getting along the track. But uh, one of the things I'd note is the, uh, the horse cost for advancing along the track. So if you'll remember, you get an extra step for one horse two extra steps for three, and three extra steps for six horses. That's really expensive. Like, as much as I want to make the Siberia track the sort of core device in this game, and I think it should be, the game still feels like a really tight resource management game. It's super tight. Obviously, there are three currencies in the game. Money, horses, and furs. And all of them feel really scarce and really tight and really valuable. The money and the horses in particular feel like you never have enough of them. And that's because they allow you to be a lot more flexible and do a lot more things. With the furs, that's a little bit more of an interesting economy because a lot of their value comes from what you can do with them, which is most typically... Uh, getting to take extra advanced actions, getting to buy the landscape tiles, and actually completing the Tsar's wishes. So you need to have specific furs, really, to get value out of them. So you can collect a lot of, like, you know, value 7 furs, but if you don't have anything to do with them, then it was kind of a wasted effort. And so one of the things, yeah, about the furs is that they're obviously numbered to indicate their value and and the bear itself which is the most valuable fur actually has two story points on it so just by dint of getting this fur you get two step ups the story track which is nice but the other furs themselves even though seven seems more valuable if you don't have anything to do with it then it's not really valuable at all except that you could trade it for any other fur from the marketplace provided the furs you need are there are present so I think that can be a little bit of a, a miss heuristic there because it's it's implied that the higher value, the higher the number on the fur, the more valuable it is. 
but its value is actually much more baked into how useful it is to you, which is really centered entirely around the actions you want to take, the landscape tiles you want to take, and these SAR wishes cards as well. Now, the one of the other things that I sort of note about the game is that, you know, a lot of it is about sort of building up sort of bonanzas of things. You know, for example, going up the story track gets you these, which get you more horses, lets you take another advanced action, banners, which get you more horse income, and um, that just improves your horse income. Um, if you take the landscapes, you're obviously doing this, uh, collecting the symbols, but you're also getting these immediate benefits shown on the bottom of the tiles. Often it's points, sometimes it's money and furs or horses or other things. And even when you're completing the Tsar's wishes, you're getting maybe story points or tigers or something else. So what this means is like everything gives you something that you can use to do something else. And so you've sort of got all these different bonanzas happening all the time, even though resources feel scarce and you never feel like there's an abundance. Every time you do something, it triggers something else, which leads you to some other part of the game. So it doesn't feel like there's a specific strategy you're pursuing. It very rarely feels like, okay, this game, I'm, it doesn't at all feel like this game, I'm going down the SARS wishes strategy and I'm going to try to do a bunch of those cards. Or in this game, I'm going to buy up tons of landscape tiles and, you know, have this whole set collection thing going on. Um, you're always doing a little bit of everything. You know, you're going to wind up getting story points whether you want to or not. You're going to wind up claiming these tiles as a result. You're going to wind up doing some SARS Wishes cards. Uh, I don't recommend ignoring them entirely because ultimately you're going to be collecting furs and you're going to want something to do with those furs. And the only really valuable things you can trade furs for are, you know, other furs. These minor things here which has to be this first specifically or landscape tiles or sars wishes cards so in order to give the the first values value you have to inherently engage with these two concepts of the game oh actually no you can also pay furs to go up your trophy track here but that's just one fur in sort of numerical order so again that's just about sort of having that when you need it at the right moment so when you get the trophy action whether it's from maybe up here or one of the uh, village markers down here or whatever you have the right fur in place to make sure you can move up this track with your marker there so the game never feels like you're pursuing a specific strategy it always feels like something's happening which has triggered something else which has allowed you to do something else and you're making these sort of small improvements gradually but you're never focusing on any one thing um, and you wouldn't benefit from trying to focus too much on one thing anyway but also you can't because everything triggers everything else. There is a nice sense of escalation in the game, which I do like. The collection of the banners, improving your horse income, the placement of the outposts, giving you access to regions even when you're not there, and the acquisition of the passive abilities from the SARS wish cards, all and also advancing on the trophy track and being able to get these. So that's really nice. Um, so yeah, as you advance on this track and you unlock all of these passive benefits, there is a nice sense of escalation to the game. It doesn't feel like, you know, you're not advancing, which is really good, especially because you'll need some extra benefits as the furs down this end become scarcer and you have to increasingly race the other players to get the new furs that are appearing in the eastmost regions. I do think that the scoring... For the landscapes and the way the SARS wishes are fulfilled feel like a little bit of a, a, a ludo narrative disconnect. I don't, if they are rooted in theme, I don't really understand how or why. It doesn't really make sense to me that I need to collect four different terrain types. And that feels kind of like it's just set collection for the sake of it. I don't know why they actually have different terrain types and you have to get different ones. Maybe it's just to make it more dynamic or so you don't just buy like the cheap ones 
at the start, although they're, they're hardly cheap and it's going to be entirely dependent on this, which could well be randomized if you're playing with the advanced setup. So I don't really understand the reason for that. And thematically, it doesn't make any sense really, unless the idea is you want to have lots of different land types. So you have a diverse kingdom. I don't really know, but that feels a little bit like it's sort of loosely veiled set collection. I don't fully understand why the Tsar wants to see three Bobcat skins. Maybe the idea is he wants to see three and then keep the nicest one. But that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me either. Maybe the idea is that that's the skin that's in fashion at that moment and then it's constantly changing, which is, you know, a commentary on the fickleness of the royal court or whatever, but it just feels like contract fulfillment, thinly veiled contract fulfillment. I did make a few notes about the, the elements of the mechanisms that I do really quite like. I really like that you're forced to move forward. I almost wish this one wasn't in the game, the action that allows you to move backwards. That feels a little bit like it undermines the whole sort of track idea. Um, I really like this idea of being forced to move forward and then being unable to go back, but you can go back. Um, you can actually go back up to four in a single turn if you want to, although it costs a lot of actions. I really like that there's not enough space for everyone's outposts. In lower player counts, these upper spaces are always available to players. So at lower player counts. At four, there's always one space too few, which I really like. I think that's really neat. I like the contention for this, especially because if you can get all five spots, there's a big reward for it, which makes it quite interesting. Uh, it's also a game of scarcity. Um, I like that you have to sort of challenge yourself to get the specific furs and specific combinations to do things. Um, I do think that there's a little bit of a randomness to the furs that come out on the tiles and how easy they are to get. For example, if you draw a bunch of fives and an eight and you're someone who wants fives, that's a real stroke of good luck. Whereas if you draw like a couple of fives and then a bunch of twos, that's a real pain because now you're gonna have to spend a bunch of horses to get to the fives or hunt all the twos. Either way, it's either wasted horses or wasted actions, which is, you know, a bummer. So that's, that can feel quite random, which doesn't necessarily feel good in a game that's so sort of tight and Eurocentric, and there's not like a lot of mitigation for that. I mean, well, there, there actually is, but all the mitigation feels, again, very expensive or suboptimal. For example, spend a coin, make it wild, that's very expensive. The coins are so hard to come by and so valuable. And you've got the marketplace over here, but again, that role is reliant on the furs you want being in the marketplace. And it's still reasonably expensive to you. Well, it costs a horse, right? Which is less bad than a coin. But again, then you have to trade down or trade two for one, which, you know, is not cheap either. So all of that is something to consider when the resource management is so tight. And that fundamentally leads me into sort of what is my, my main issue with this game. I mean, if you've watched my videos, then you know that I'm big on player interaction. But if a puzzle's compelling, it's not a deal breaker. But generally speaking, I prefer games with a lot of player interaction. In this game, most of the player interaction is you took that thing I wanted, right? Um, there's not really much more to it than that, which is fine. Um, I'm genuinely fine with that kind of player interaction. You know, I really like Caverna, which is just that player interaction. I also like Agricola, which is the same thing, but you know, that's another conversation. The point is I'm okay with that. I'm okay with sort of timing considerations based around you took the thing I wanted and having to prioritize. Um, where it becomes, I think, a bit of a problem in this game is that on your turn, there's a lot you can do. You know, you can do up to three actions. Those actions are gonna be more expensive based on where you are potentially. You want to plan your resources around doing all of this. That's gonna be based on, you know, what's going on on the board, what yurts are available, you know, what SAR cards might be available, what furs are gonna be available up here. This is really quite important, not to be underestimated. Uh, what 
uh, landscape tiles are available. For example, if you plan to go hunting on a landscape tile, it might not be there when it gets around to your turn. Maybe, you know, if there's furs left on it, it might be too expensive. But you've got to keep your eye on who's got enough deer to buy this landscape tile if you want to get to it. Because if they buy it before you can get to it, then you're going to lose the hunting opportunities, you know? And then when you're moving, you get to jump over it so you can move further. But, you know, if you wanted to move one to here, because in two turns you wanted to use something on this landscape tile, and then blue goes and buys this tile, you're here. Now you're forced to move one forward. You're here a turn early and your timing's all messed up. So there's a lot to be sort of thinking about. And the board and the state of the game can change quite dynamically. Maybe your whole turn was built around putting out an outpost somewhere and then all three spots are taken by the time it gets to you. So things can fundamentally change really significantly, which, you know, in theory I like. I really like it when the board state is dynamic and I think that this game wants to have four players to maximize that uh, dynamism. However, the BGG lists the game best at three, and that's because it wants to reach for that dynamism, but at four players, the downtime's excruciating. And that's because there's so much people can do, and it's so hard to plan for your turn because everything's changing in a way that can be really significant given how tight the resource management is in this game. You know, and then you've got so many ways to solve your problems through spending money, through trading in the marketplace. So you've got all these methods for problem solving, and then you're debating whether it's worth it. Has it become too inefficient to do the thing you're planning to do? Or maybe there's some other move that's just opened up that could be potentially a lot stronger. And so there's a lot of thought that you have to put into a turn that is difficult to do in advance. You can tent pull some major elements of your strategy, sure, but you really can't plan around it. And for a game that's this tight on resources, that leads to a lot of downtime. And at four, the downtime's pretty awful. It's probably better at three, I think, you know, but I think, like, given the situation, you'd probably want to play at two, but then the game would stop being so dynamic. The appeal of the Siberia track would just become a lot less because... You know, although there's fewer hunting uh, furs out on this track, there's fewer spaces available generally, it does feel like it sort of wants to be somewhere around the three players. It really feels like there's some real pros to three players and some real cons to three as well, same at four. And that's just kind of a shame because it means it hasn't managed to really find its sweet spot for player count and you can kind of see it struggle. You know, because the dynamism of the four player game is really cool, but the downtime is awful. And, you know, the downtime in this game, I found, even with a good group that are very fast players, I still found it to be quite painful. And it's just not quite a compelling enough package or right at any specific player count to the degree where it's probably not going to stay in my collection. In fact, it's not. I'm going to move it on, which is sad, really, because there's so much about it that I do like the artwork and the idea, the track idea and all that stuff. Uh, the setup and tear as a, as a final note, the setup and tear down is a little bit of a pain. It wouldn't be a deal breaker if the game was really good, um, but the game's not quite there either. Um, the replayability is really good. Actually, I think there's a lot of uh, variability to the setup, which is interesting. I think that the dynamics of the puzzle can change in quite an interesting way. Having the outpost markers up here, for example, was a twist on this particular setup that's interesting. Um, there, the variability in these furs up here as well, I imagine, would make the game feel very different. Uh, I do think there might be a bit of an issue with sort of low-level heuristics around the value of furs, uh, which the randomization of these tokens would make more challenging, which is why they recommend it for experienced players. And I definitely think that's absolutely the case, um, that you should stick to only experienced players playing with those randomized fur tokens up there. So in terms of the sort of the variability of the setup, uh, really good. Lots of variability there. 
Uh, but one other issue I had was the lack, of, and I meant touched on this earlier, which is the lack of distinct strategies. You know, I think that the skill curve in this game comes from being familiar with the mechanisms, which is, you know, normal, but particularly in this case, the familiar with being able to evaluate the value of the furs and understanding how, for example, limited access to the outpost supply, the, the tokens here is going to impact the game, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's not, there's not necessarily diverse strategies to explore here. It's more just like reading the randomized nature of the board state so you can mitigate against the challenges it presents, which is not, I think, the most interesting kind of skill curve, you know. I much prefer it when the game is like, here are many different potential strategies to explore. And I think for that to be really compelling, there needs to be ways to specialize. And this game just doesn't have it. Like I said, you will wind up doing everything. You can't specialize and uh, it would not benefit you to try so that's a bit of a shame um but otherwise you know if if the the core gameplay excites you then the randomized setup is going to make that feel at least reasonably different every time and offer some different challenges so to summarize i don't think there's any reasonable comparison to be made between stroganov and hansa teutonica that doesn't seem like a sensible thing to compare it to it feels much more comparable to Gugong because they are both Euro games with many different action space opportunities and timing considerations. There's still not a lot of obvious comparisons between them other than their Euro games that use some standard Euro mechanisms like contract fulfillment and tracks. But you know, they, they at least feel more comparable than Hansa, and I would much rather play Gugong than this. I have not yet explored all the expansions in that box, so I'm very excited to explore Gugong more. I'm not really excited to go back to Stroganov. I took a look at the new stuff in the big box that's up on GameFound. I don't think those modules are going to be particularly uh, revolutionary in terms of my criticisms of the game. So I'm not, uh, I don't think that's enough to bring me back around to it. I think that fundamentally, if the mechanism that appeals to you about this game is this track and the sort of positioning on the track and how it's sort of difficult to move uh, backwards, but you have to move forwards and the sort of the timing of your positioning on this track. Um, I think if that's something that really appeals to you, then there are better games that use sort of tracks in an interesting way. Um, if you're looking for something that's sort of lighter and more accessible, um, I mean, Rajas of the Ganges is really good. It's not especially comparable, except that it's got a track on it that you can't move backwards on. And there's lots of benefits to racing till the end. Now, this is one small part of that game, but there are benefits to racing to the end of that track. And... There are also benefits to really taking your time and trying to stop as many times as possible to gain benefits as you move along the track. But it's a really solid game and I recommend checking that out. Uh, the other one I would recommend if you're really into this sort of like uh, not dynamic track system, you know, i.e. a track that's sort of fixed in ways that are designed to be puzzling, um, the, a much bigger puzzle would be Anachrony with it, its time track where you send resources back in time and then when you reach spaces in the future you have to pay off the resources you spent sent back in time um, and you can also go back in time to build cards from a marketplace that exists previously uh, so you can sort of shift your focus forward and back along the track as you move along the track which represents time it's a time travel game so you're moving forward in time all the time but you can kind of jump back in time to prevent paradoxes and pay off loans that you gave yourself and stuff so that's a much more interesting use of a track mechanism that uh i say that's a much more dynamic use of a track mechanism with so much less of the downtime it's a really great worker placement game so that's worth checking out and it's perfect at three so it's found its sweet spot player count, which I think is really important. I mean, but Anachrony is quite a bit heavier. I think it's like a four point something, so quite a bit heavier than Stroganov. 
but worth it if if this kind of track puzzle is something you're intrigued by anyway that's it for me and stroganoff i hope you've enjoyed this video this was filmed on the game topper you can find a link to that in the description below the review content on this show is entirely funded by the patrons without whom we wouldn't be able to have this editorial freedom to make the reviews we want to make and say the things we want to say. So if you'd like to support this kind of content, please feel free to go check out the patron where we're constantly talking about what we should play on the show and the games that I should cover as well. If you're not in a position to support the show financially, that's completely understandable. Please consider just throwing down a like, subscribing to the channel, and if you thought this was useful, tell a friend. In the meantime, thanks very much for watching and I hope to see you guys in the next video. Bye.